If you're able, comfortably, would you remain standing as we honor God's word, which comes to us this morning from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, You will know my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Last week, we began a Lenten sermon series talking about some of the promises that Jesus gives his disciples and to us from the upper room. And last week, we talked about the promise of a dwelling place. We might say that last week we were talking about the promise of a destination, and this morning we perhaps are talking about the promise of the journey to get there. Let's prepare our hearts now as we pray. Oh Lord, these words are yours. These are your eternal words spoken by you, and thus we ask that you would speak again. Speak your eternal word that does not change. Help us to have open ears and allow you to be our teacher. We humbly ask in Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned last week in the preceding chapter, Jesus is speaking to his closest followers, the 12 apostles. He's been telling them three troubling things that are about to happen. One, he will, he's telling them he will soon die. Two, his heart is deeply troubled that one of the twelve will betray him. And then Judas goes out into the darkness. And then he goes on to say that their leader, Peter, will deny his Lord three times before morning. So we have eleven troubled hearts in the room. Twelve counting Jesus. And to this Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. In the face of all that's going on around them and frightful predictions about what will happen soon, they're supposed to have untroubled hearts? Really? I mean, you got to love Thomas. You have to love Thomas when he blurts out. He says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How are we going to know the way? I think Thomas is like a lot of concrete, sequential thinkers. All this talk of mansions and rooms and goings and comings, it just doesn't cut cut it for him. He needs to know the facts. He doesn't want any more metaphor talk, fancy talk. Cut it all out. Tell it to me straight, he says, respectfully, of course. (laughs) And so Jesus says, okay, Thomas, here it is. I'm going to the Father. Now, you can find God by following after me, for I am the way, the truth, and the life, and you must come to the Father through me. What a remarkable claim. This is perhaps the most remarkable claim anyone could ever make. I can't imagine any other person making this claim without all of us breaking up into laughter or worried concern for their mental health. But Jesus gives us more than a map. He not only plainly and and personally shows us the way to God, he actually is promising to take us to him. He's talking about the journey to get there, that he will take us, that we can go with him. And then he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one's going to make this journey unless, I, unless you go with me. And I know in our world, people are troubled by that statement. They're strong words. Strong words that Jesus makes about being the only way. And I have prayed over these words this week. 
not because they are unclear, but because it is so clear, and Jesus' words in many ways are so conflicting with our modern understanding of how the world and how we think it ought to work. He hits right at where we live. And if you're like me, you love two things. You love being in charge and you love having choices, right? Are these not the deep-seated values that we often, if we're, if, we're, if we're honest, that we want, that we need to admit to? Being in charge and having choices. And both of those values are deeply problematic to the Jesus way. A few times in my life, I have uh, had the courage to venture into this domain that I, afterwards, I, I was thinking, why did I go there? Why did I do that? It was, it was a difficult domain for me, but I did do it, and I ventured into it. And, I, and of course, I'm talking about the store Ikea. Have you ever been to Ikea? <laughs> <coughs> Have you ever been there? I don't like it. <laughs> And the reason I, I mean, for a whole lot of reasons, not only that you have to put everything together, but I don't like the experience of being in there because they put arrows on the floor and make you walk the way they make you walk. I mean, and you, they take you the long way through the entire store, every floor. You got to follow these arrows. I, I, I can't, it drives me crazy. I'm there to get what I want, and I want to go to my section. I don't want to be told that I have to go this way. It's so frustrating. Are you with me on this? <laughs> All right, thank you. I thought I was the only one. Our modern ears do not like anyone in our hearts taking away our choice. And our ability to control how we move forward, what we do, where we go. And so when Jesus says, I am the way, the only way, the only choice, we struggle. Sometimes we hear that as him taking away control and choice. Instead, what we should be hearing is an invitation to a gift and a life that is unimaginably good. Stacked up to everything else around it, there is no choice. It's that good. When I first became a pastor, I was an associate pastor and I worked with a youth group in our church and we had a large youth group and we were taking a mission trip to Tijuana, Mexico. And we had about 100 students that were going on this trip, and we were going with Presbyterian Border Ministry in Tijuana. I was sent ahead of our group to go down and scout it out, make sure everything was set, and make sure that it could handle us and do all the scouting that needed to happen before our trip. So I, I rented a car, and I called the leader of Presbyterian Border Ministries, a man named Bill Soldwich, and I said, Bill, can you give me directions to the mission? Can you give me directions? This is now, again, this is before cell phones. This is before GPS. This is before any of that. So Bill said this to me. He says, all right, I'll give you directions. Here's what you need to do. When you come across the border, there's about 12 lanes. I want you to be in the seventh lane. <laughs> and then when you go through the border in the seventh lane, I want you to drive for a little bit. And then you'll see a big building on the right. Don't turn there. Keep going. Keep going. Then there'll be an exit, there'll be a roundabout. And in the roundabout, I want you to take the third exit off the roundabout, go down a little ways, you're gonna see a big open field, don't do anything there, just pass that open field. And then you're gonna go down and then there's a four-way stop. Go straight through the four-way stop until you get to the next exit and that'll be a, you can take a right turn, you'll see a store there. This went on for about 15 minutes. And then at the end he said, all right, y'all set? And I said, oh, okay. I was feeling very anxious. I was feeling very worried. 
That phone call left me very afraid. I started to think about this. I was going to be driving all alone in a foreign country. My identity would be thrown into chaos. I didn't speak the language. Everything would be foreign. I didn't understand fully that culture. Again, I had no cell phone to rely on, no map, no GPS. And I began to ask all these questions to myself. What if I get lost? I don't know the way. What am I going to do then? What, where would I turn? What would I do? And I had no one to go with me. I was going to be all alone. This would have been much easier to have someone go with me. Our sociologists are raising an alarm bell in our culture right now. We have a big, big problem on our hands. A big problem. They are telling us that there is a massive increase, shocking increase in the amount of anxiety and depression and stress of our teenagers. It's rising in an alarming way. So much anxiety and worry. They say that perhaps this has been in, in, on the increase because of the pandemic. Some people are saying it's because of the rise of social media. And maybe these things are, are pushing it along at a, at a higher speed or rate. But again, the number of teens who feel all alone and anxious is at an all-time high. And I think a lot of it has to do, at the core, a lot of it has to do with this great confusion about purpose and identity. Who am I? With the breakdown of the family and traditional Christian values in our society underpinning it, teens are left with so much confusion about who they are and where they belong. And here's the two values that they are taught. Here's the two values that they, that they keep hearing over and over and over again. You are in charge. You have choices. How's that working? You're in charge. You have choices. They are not getting clear instruction on this. No one is speaking to them with a clear and tender voice. It is a voice that is harsh and distance, distant and comes through social media most often. Imagine graduating from high school with this message. You are whoever you want to be. Blank slate. You, are, you can just create your own identity. Pick your life. It's all up to you. And by the way, you're all alone in this endeavor. You must create it on your own. All kinds of choices. Be true to who you are is the message that, it, that comes across. And it's all so confusing and they are so frail. It's like the message is coming to them, be in the seventh lane and then turn here and then turn here and then turn here and then turn here. There's no specific, there's no instruction and it's leaving them so anxious and afraid. And it's not just teenagers. It's us as well. And we feel it and we feel alone and we feel not up to it. Deep down, we know that I can't make the best choices of my life. I understand my frail nature. It leaves us anxious, feeling alone, feeling depressed. Kind of like Thomas. Lord, I, how can we know the way? That's what Thomas said. Lord, how... I don't have the first idea how to get there. How can we know the way, Thomas says. I love Thomas. It's the best question. It's honest. We don't know the way. What are we supposed to do? After sitting with my anxiety for quite a while, I called Bill Soldwich back, and in a moment of vulnerability, I said, Bill... I am not good with directions. <laughs> I'm confused. I need help. After a long pause, Bill said, well, 
I have another idea. How about if I drive to the border, park my car, and then you can follow me all the way to the mission? Never have I felt so relieved. (laughs) All anxiety gone, I had a guide. I had a trusted guide. I had a friend. Those in deep need cry out, I need a guide. I can't do this. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are willing to say, I can't do this. Not strong enough. All of these choices are are causing me anxiety. To which Jesus says, in a tender voice, I'm the way. Follow me. I'll show you. I'll take you there. I'll, I'll, you can follow near to me, with me. I will be the one. He comes personally and says, I'm your friend. I will show you. I will take you. Is that controlling? Is that taking away choices? Or is that an unimaginable gift? And how good it is. Jesus says, I am the way. You know, in the Old Testament, all the pages of the Old Testament are wrestling with the promise that the Messiah will come and will take us home. The pages of the New Testament are telling us that Jesus is that Messiah. And the first time he came, he began to heal our homelessness. And when he comes again, he will end our homelessness forever. Isaiah the prophet predicted this would be the way. He said, a highway will be there. It'll be called the way of holiness. It'll be for those who walk on that way. Do you know that early Christians were known as people of the way? They were known as people of the highway. They were traveling in a whole different way. After Jesus was resurrected, he met with his followers, and then the Holy Spirit came upon them and They followed the way that Jesus lived. They practiced things like forgiveness and mercy. They they cared deeply for each other. They cared for the poor. Every Sunday they would gather and sing songs and read ancient words that described this highway. And what about identity? What about their identity? There was no search for identity. They gave it up. There was no need. Why? Why? Because they were so deeply loved. Their identity was as a child of God. They had so much joy because they realized that they had a a way to go that was good and right. They had a way home. They they remembered that Jesus said, don't despair. I'm going to my father's house and I'm going to take you there so that where I I am, you may be also. This highway was so different. The whole Roman world was traveling down a completely different road. So were the Greeks, so are the Americans. The road that they were traveling was power and violence. That road said might makes right, but Jesus' road was about the least and the lost. It was for those that humbled themselves and sacrificed and were generous with what they had. And and by the way, not everyone who was traveling on that road was well-liked. They were persecuted. Some got angry at them. Some of them were killed for traveling that road, and some still are today. But they could never take away their joy. And the movement and the way kept growing. There was this band of people that said, we're going to give up choice and control. We're going to follow this one. And they found peace and they found joy. And they also discovered purpose and mission for their life. They discovered on this way that they could be a part of something. Something wonderful like Caring for the poor, feeding the hungry, visiting the prisoner, comforting the grieving, loving the enemy, blessing those who curse them. Not only did they walk with Jesus, but they became a a vital part of his mission, his unfolding drama to redeem the world and reconcile all of us to himself. Our teenagers need a mission and a purpose. They do. So do we. Desperately. You want to know what is better than control and choice? 
being yoked to Jesus, following him, being a part of his mission. C.S. Lewis captured this very well. In the Chronicles of Narnia, book four, The Silver Chair, he describes this scene. And remember that Aslan, the great lion, is the Christ figure. In this story, Jill and Scrub, these two children, are thrust into this world of Narnia, and they're, they're all alone, and they're in the woods, and Scrub gets pushed off of a cliff. Jill is now all alone. She's scared. She's anxious. She's worried. And then she hears a voice. If you're thirsty, you may drink. They were the first words she had heard since Scrub had spoken to her on the edge of the cliff. For a second, she stared here and there, wondering who had spoken. And then the voice said again, if you're thirsty, come and drink. And it, of course, she remembered what Scrub had said about animals talking in that other world and realized that it was the lion speaking. Anyway, she had seen its lips move this time, and the voice was not like a man's. It was deeper, wilder, stronger, sort of heavy, golden voice. It did not make her any less frightened than she had been before, but it made her frightened in a rather different way. Are you not thirsty, said the lion? I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. <coughs> then may I drink? May I drink? Then drink, said the lion. May I? Could I? I mean, would you mind going away while I do? Said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will, will, um, will, you, promise, will you promise not to... Will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Well, Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do, do, you, do you eat girls, she said. <laughs> I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor if it were sorry, nor if it were angry. It just said it, well, I dare not come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I, I suppose I, I, I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. It never occurred to Jill to disbelieve the lion. No one who had, who had seen his stern face could do that. And her mind suddenly made itself up. It was the worst thing she'd ever had to do. But she went forward to the stream, knelt down. She began scooping up water in her hand. It was the coldest, most refreshing water she had ever tasted. You did not need to drink much of it, for it quenched your thirst at once. Friends, this is what you and I need to know. It's what our children need to know. They're so thirsty. We are so thirsty. But the best news is, our Lord provides us water for our souls. Purpose, mission, a way to walk. And he's going to bring us home. When we come to this table, we see here a, a marker. People who walk on the way of Jesus love to come to this table. They love to come to this table because here they're reminded that they are children of God. Here we are reminded, we get a physical reminder that we can be a part of the way and that he's taking us home. He's given his life for us.